Have you guys enjoyed this month? Thank you for the four of you who've liked it. That's good. It's just been awesome for me to think of how uh, because of the faithfulness of Dave Pound, who shared here a couple weeks ago, and, and just because of the faithfulness of Charles Hill, and just the faithfulness of so many people here, just to look and see what God has done and how he's multiplied his kingdom and how we get to be a part of that. And I'm really excited about that. I want to talk some uh, with you about that today. One of my favorite stories just from my life was when I was in high school. And uh, I worked at a Shell gas station. On my resume, it actually said I was a petroleum transfer technician. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, it wasn't a very hard job. And I had to pump some gas and stock some shelves and sweep a little bit and, uh, and you know, just do some, some basic automotive stuff. Well, there was one guy who worked at the gas station who wasn't very good at these types of things. And so one day a gentleman pulled in, and, and, and the, Mike was his name. Mike was filling up uh, this car when all of a sudden the guy asked a terrible question. He said, can you please check my oil? And so Mike opened up the gentleman's hood, and, and he looked around and found the dipstick. And for those of you who don't know how to do this, he pulled it out. He wiped it off, he put it back in, he pulled it out, and he looked, and this gentleman needed some oil. And so he asked him what kind, and then went into the gas station, got that kind of oil, and, uh, and he walked back out, and he began to look all over the place to find the little cap that says oil. And he couldn't find it. I mean, it was eluding him. And so eventually, he just kind of got nervous, and he panicked, and he just randomly unscrewed a cap, and started to add oil. Well, at this point, the gentleman peeked around and, and looked, and he said, that's my transmission fluid reservoir. And Mike, being quick on his feet, said, oh, it's actually good to put a little oil there from time to time. Let me go get some more oil and put it where it's supposed to go. But he still couldn't find out where it was supposed to go. So before oil actually got where oil was supposed to go, it not only got put in the transmission it got put in the radiator and in the windshield washer fluid compartment, and it cost the gas station thousands of dollars to have this guy's systems in his car flush so that it would work properly. Well, Mike, being the mayor's son, kept his job. And it wasn't a couple weeks later where one evening a nice lady pulled in, and she, he was filling her car up, and she too asked, the dreaded question, can you check my oil? And so Mike lifted the hood, he put the prop rod in, he found the dipstick, he pulled it out, he wiped it off, he put it back in, he pulled it out, and she too needed oil. So he found her, she was doing some shopping in the convenience store and, and asked what kind, she told him, he got it, he went out, and, and it was like beams of light shooting down from heaven. He saw the cap, it said oil, there was the yellow ring. He unscrewed it, he poured oil in there, and in his excitement, he grabbed the hood, forgetting to remove the prop rod, he pulled it, and he put a little bend in her hood. You know, a hood isn't supposed to look like a teepee. And, and, and so he, he removed the prop rod, and he was trying to get that sucker shut, and it just wasn't happening. And she saw this, and then they started to talk, and he called the, the manager. The manager wasn't home. He called the owners. They weren't home. And so he came up with a brilliant strategy. He said, I'm going to take some rope, and I'm going to wrap it around your car and tie, the, tie it shut, and, and you should be able to get the 10 miles you're going tonight, and, and then you can call back tomorrow. Well, she got about halfway there. A strong gust of wind came along, blew her hood up, snapped it off, smashed her windshield. She was fine, but yet again, the gas station was out tons of money. I tell you this story for one reason. Mike was actually trying to do his best. In both of these situations, he wasn't trying to mess up anyone's cars. He was actually working hard to do as, as well as he could, and that was the result in both of these instances. Now, can anyone else testify to having experienced anything similar where you try really hard, you put forth good effort, and you don't seem to get much in return? Anyone else 
Come on, right? I mean, this just happens to be how life is sometimes. It, it becomes our experience. We've experienced this reality. And even with simple things, let me show you just a list of things. If, if we were talking about Christian maturity, you know, we could say someone who has faith, they really trust God. In adversity, in difficult times, they have this courage that seems to be present. They, they just have this overall character, this, this sense of holiness that they've really set their lives apart for God. They, they have quality relationships because people turn to them and look to them. They have discipline and self-control. They don't just say one thing and always cave like many of us tend to. They, they have knowledge and wisdom in life. That, that transcends maybe what they should have. There's this sense of continuous growth, right? It's, it's not just praying a prayer, but it's this, this progressive sense of, of knowing God more and being more faithful to him. And, and there's purpose in their, their service and in their calling. They, they know what God is asking them to do. And, and, but even with some things like this, some of these simple, basic, you know, this should start happening and, and being a part of our lives more and more, even with stuff like this, we can't do it, right? I mean, many of us have tried to do those things in and of ourselves, and, and we can't do that. So what do we do? What, what's the step that we take? And that's what this series, Multiply, ha has been all about. And I want to talk to you today just about how we can grow our own roots so that we can be a part of something bigger. Because it's cool, it's cool to think that there was a church that planted a church that started two campuses that became churches, you know. I mean, it's, it's awesome to sort of think about what God has done through the history of our church in, in less than 10 years. But God wants each of us to be a part of what the next 10 years look like and the 10 years after that. And so how do we position ourselves in such a way that God's work cannot have just happened because of everyone else, but it can happen because of me and because of you. And so, Father, today we thank you so much that you love us. God, we thank you so much for what you have done uh, through this church in, in just less than a decade. And, Lord, we thank you for the expressions of the New Hope family that, that are all around this region. But God, it's not just about looking back. It's also about looking forward and asking, how do you want to continue to multiply your kingdom in and through this church and in and through us as individuals? So God, I just pray you would give us one clear thought today of a way that, that we can be a part of your multiplication movement here in this place and around the world. We ask these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so... One clear thought. Are you ready? Because does anyone else want to know how to do this? How, how, do, how do you put your roots down? How do you make a difference? We want to know this, right? Okay. I got, I've got to warn you. It's easy, but I'm, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you this is, this is an awesome thing that I do well because I struggle with this one too. The one thought I want to share with you today is solitude. I really want us to think about this idea of solitude. And the definition is this, a state of seclusion or isolation, i.e. a lack of contact with people. Short-term solitude is often valued as time when one may work, think, or rest without being disturbed. It may be desired for the sake of privacy, and many religions promote solitude. The last time I, I did this was actually, I did it last night and then some this morning. And part of my routine on Sundays is just to, to, to be up a lot of times before my family is and before there's motion that turns into chaos. Anyone else have that experience on Sundays especially? I don't know why. Um, it, but I just, I like to be up where it's just quiet and, and it's me and God and I can think and I can pray. And I, I really believe that the church, and not just our church, but the church in general, does a really good job of teaching us about spiritual disciplines. And even to the point where many of us are convinced that prayer is a good idea. Many of us are convinced that, that spending time reading the scriptures and studying them is a good idea. We're convinced that journaling and all these different disciplines, we're convinced these are good ideas, but we never ever hardly 
make the space to practice them. And that's what solitude is about. It's about taking the time and creating the space where we can spend time with God in a way that the things that we wish we could do or would like to do, we actually have the time and space to to do them. So I want to quickly just give you seven examples where we see Jesus doing this. Uh, Because I don't want you to think that this is just, you know, we could look at a passage and see that Jesus did this, and then we make kind of a mountain out of a molehill. I want you to see that this is a practice that was really important. It was something that Jesus practiced consistently. It was a part of of his life and journey. So the first thing we see here is, is Jesus practicing solitude at the beginning of ministry. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 say this. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So when Jesus is starting his ministry, he takes 40 days and 40 nights, he goes out into the desert or the wilderness. Uh, That word can be translated both ways. So he goes out to this place by himself. He's tempted by the devil, and, and he doesn't eat anything for this period of time. Now, have you ever noticed that, that we use hostility sometimes? Like when, when you try to do something and you encounter resistance or something blows up in life. Does, is anyone else like me where you kind of like to use that as an excuse? You know what I mean? Well, I was going to go on a diet, but this happened and I had to do that, right? You know what I mean? We, we like to use these, these disturbances in life as a reason why we don't follow through and practice what we said we were going to practice. But Jesus uses hostility to to push him even deeper into trusting his father. I told you guys this back in in January, but I think it illustrates the point well. Because if I was Jesus here, thank God I wasn't, you know, and, and, you know, there's like the temptation piece along with the, that I'm not eating for 40 days piece, like those two things combined, you know, you'd be like, this, this temptation's getting difficult. I think I might need to mix in a, a snack, you know? Anyone else with me here? Uh, we do this. And, and, and so it reminds me of the first time that, that I, I, I really felt like God was asking me to do an extended fast. And, and uh, how it looked is I was we were a part of our first church plant, and the other pastor and I was right after lunch, which is always the time that you choose to, to do a spontaneous fast. It's right after you've eaten a big meal. And so we just felt like we needed to see God work and move in our church. And so we were like, you know what? We are going to fast and we are going to pray until God shows up in a big way. And we're, you know, we're excited. We're pumped about this. And, uh, and, and, and so the day unfolds. A few hours later, the first few hours are okay. Get to dinner time. Uh, we were actually, it was the start of this church plant. Bethany and I were living with, with this couple because we were trying to close on a, buying our first house. And, uh, and, and, and so that evening, Bethany and I had a date night. And so we went to Barnes & Noble. It was one of our practices. We just went and sat and we'd read books and chat together and look at magazines and, and things like that. And, and so I remember deciding that night I was going to pull a couple books, uh, medical books off the shelf about fasting. And because and, I wanted to read up a little bit. So I remember reading and going, oh, yeah, you know, don't jump in big, ease yourself in. I started filling my heart and mind with thoughts like this because we were, you know, we were going whole. And, and now it's like 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. So now, you know, I mean, it's been 10 hours into this. You're starting to get really hungry. Uh, and so I remember going back. Bethany went to bed. Dave was still up. And, and I started sharing some of these things with him about, well, you know, it's probably not the best thing medically just to jump in like this. We should ease ourselves in. And, 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 and it didn't take more than five minutes for he and I to get in his car, drive the half mile to Steak and Shake, and gorge ourselves on horrible food. Now, I, 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 a huge, huge, huge fail. But we do this, don't we? I mean, in our lives where it's like, God, I'm going to do something great for you, and then something happens. Guess what? Something always happens. We see Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, he practices solitude, and he doesn't let anything detract him from this. Not a lack of food, not temptation, direct temptation from from Satan himself. So if you're going to start something, if you're going to start something for God, 
And even if you're not doing it for God, if you're going to start anything at all, but you want God to go with you, following Jesus' example and practicing solitude at the beginning would be an important thing. The second thing we see is solitude before making important decisions. Before Jesus made important decisions, this was a practice of his. In Luke 6, verses 12 and 13, the Bible says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. So here Jesus is trying to figure out who he's going to pick to be his, his followers, his disciples, the ones who will carry his message out into the world and, and be responsible for this message even after he's gone. And so what does he do to begin this? He practices solitude. He gets alone with his father. So if you're trying to figure something out, whose input and wisdom do you need? I mean, we tend to ask everybody else, right? I mean, we have people that we go to, people we want to talk to. But whose input and wisdom do you want? Because a lot of times it seems like God is the last person that we ask. For me, I want the guy who by the power of his spoken word, the universe was created to, to speak into what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to figure out and the decisions that I have to make in life. The third way we see Jesus practicing solitude is at the death of a close friend. Matthew 14, 10 through 13, the Bible says, uh, John had, or Herod had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus, when Jesus heard what was happening, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. So Jesus practices solitude at, at the, the death of the loss of a close friend. He needs time to grieve. He needs time to ask why, maybe to be comforted. And I think for all of us, if, if you've ever experienced the loss of someone close, we, we eventually get to this place, don't we, where at, at the beginning there's people around and there's, there's cards and there's phone calls, there's all this kind of stuff. And, but eventually people go home. And eventually things get really, really quiet. And yet the pain of loss is still very real. And for me... I experienced this because I've spent, you know, the better part of the last 20 years telling people that God will comfort them. But a few years back when my dad passed away, I had the opportunity to, to really experience this for myself at a whole new level. And for me, it was always the middle of the night, you know, and, and everybody could still be around. Bethany could be laying right next to me, but fast asleep. It was always the middle of the night where, where I just sort of ran into this experience of going, God, it hurts, and I feel alone, and, and instead of turning to anything else, I look to God, and I want you to know, in, in my moment of need, God was there, and God was real. I didn't have to turn to anything else. What would it look like if we actually started at that place, when, when there was a huge catastrophic loss of any kind in our life, instead of doing everything else first, what if we just sort of rested in God and said, I'm, I'm going to carve out some space and get with you and allow you to sustain me instead of all these other things that are going to fade eventually. The fourth way we see Jesus practicing solitude is at the pressure of popularity. Matthew 14, 23 says, After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. Now, we, this verse falls right after the feeding of the 5,000, which Pastor Tim, I think, taught on last week. And, and so here this happens, this incredible thing where Jesus feeds 5,000 men, we believe. And so with women and children, we're probably looking at 12, 15,000, something like that. And, and, and so he just does this incredible thing. And what does he do? He goes off and he gets alone. Now, what this says is Jesus had a really good perspective here. He was saying, hey, it's not about me. It's about my father. 
if it was you or I, would we do this differently maybe? Because after this, after this time of solitude, um, it wasn't just that this kind of thing empowered his ability to do this, but then he goes down and he walks on the water. So we see this incredible thing happen even immediately after this. And, and if we want this kind of potency in our lives, I think practicing the thing that we see Jesus practicing is important because, you know, it, the, the, the scriptures teach that the crowds continue to follow him, right? Because he, he fed their belly. So now they're full. He's able to, to dismiss them and leave, but then they're coming back because they want to see him again because what happens the next day? Breakfast. Amen? You know, I have dinner. I'm full, but I want breakfast, especially if there's bacon. I don't know if there would have been here. but um, and, and so this, uh, for me, because does anyone else like to be liked? Does anyone else love it when people sort of look to you? We do, don't we? And so for me, it's like, hey, good, good dinner, huh? <laughs> Let's see what we can do for breakfast. You know what I mean? It's sort of this tendency we have to think that, man, people really like me right now, and so what more can I do? What more can I offer? Instead of saying, you know what? I'm going to have nothing at all of value to offer if I don't get alone and make sure I'm connected with the one who did all of it anyway. Jesus certainly practices that. The fifth way we see solitude is, is that the uh, daily demands of life. When life happens, does life ever happen for anyone else here? You know what I mean? And, and it seems counterintuitive in these moments to pull away. And this struggle is normal, isn't it? Because when, when life demands that we act, what, what is our response? You know, who do we want our source to be? Because have you ever experienced something maybe like this? For me, I, I remember one time procrastinating. I know none of you are procrastinators, but I remember in high school procrastinating. And, and it was the night before a huge paper was due, and it was getting later on in the evening, and so I knew that I was going to be sitting at the computer all night. And, and this one instance in particular, I actually decided to open my Bible to pray, to spend some time reading the scriptures before I did this. Now, logically, that made no sense, but I did it. And do you know the strangest thing happened? God blessed that in such a way where where I actually wrote the paper more quickly. I had better clarity of thought and focus. Um, because I honored God first, he blessed the rest. The craziest thing. Have you ever done this where you're looking for something and you're doing everything you can to find it and you can't find it? And then it dawns on you to maybe sit down for a second and pray to ask God to help you? And you, it's, it's almost like you say amen and you look and it's right there. Amen? And so what do we do? How do we practice this when life crashes in? Do we think that us working hard enough will get it done? Or do we look to God and ask him to empower all of it as though he was the vine and we were simply a branch? James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. What this passage tells me is that there are things that God has for us to do, but there's also someone who he's created us to be. This, this idea that, that there's two sides of the same coin, and, and when the daily pressures of life, when life crashes in, the reason we need to get away is because we eventually do have to act. But what do we do? We want to act with potency. We want to act in ways that make a difference. You see, the church, as I like to say, is the cross in action. It's not just the idea. There's a lot of churches that say, hey, you know, agree with me and think like I do. And there's a lot of churches that want to go into the world and do good. Which one's more important? Both, right? It's two sides of the same coin. If we do one but not the other, we miss the boat, which is why when life crashes in and the daily demands of life show up, we've got to practice solitude. Six, we see Jesus practicing solitude before significant events. Matthew 17, 1 through 3, the scripture says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. 
There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. You see, this, this wasn't too long before Jesus was no longer going to be there. And even though they had learned a lot from him and they had done a lot for him, does anyone else ever forget sometimes? You know, Jesus has been so faithful, but then we forget. We doubt. We think that, that he won't show up in the same way or he can't show up in the same way. And, and so Peter, James, and John here, at, at this moment for them that was so important, they went with Jesus and they saw who he was. Really? Do you think that helped them the next time they doubted? The next time they, they needed something? The next time something was up? Whatever the significant event is, um, knowing who Jesus is and seeing clearly who he is is something we all need. The last one is this. Jesus practices solitude before facing death. Matthew 26, 36 says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. If this was your end, who would you want to spend time with? Who would you need to spend time with? See, this practice of solitude was so pervasive for Jesus. We see it happening everywhere, all the time throughout his life. Uh, and even so, is, isn't it tough? Anyone else? It's just tough? The pace of life is so busy. There's so many things to do. Our calendars are so full that the idea of getting away and just hanging out with Jesus is crazy. Because, you see, we live in a world where we got to get things done, don't we? And, and, and so, but let me ask you this. Even, even though this is true, has anybody been planning on getting something done for, for quite a while and it hasn't gotten done yet? Like, and let me just ask maybe a few questions just in case it's not you. There you go. The, you know, that's just totally inappropriate, Jackie, to raise your husband's hand like that. Come on. <laughs> Let, let's pray for them. Um, so, like, anyone else been planning on a diet for a long time now? You haven't quite gotten there? Uh-huh. Amen. Some of you aren't to the place of honesty. That's okay. Um, how about uh, a project around the house? Uh-huh. Yeah, and for some of you, I, I've heard about these, and you've had to take multiple days off work, and it's still not really getting done, so I know. Um, how about just some random cleaning? Maybe it's your garage, maybe it's your bedroom, you know, any, any random cleaning that you've just been planning to get around to for a long time now, and it's, see? So, I mean, there's stuff that needs to get done, but, but we're all kind of admitting that, that the stuff isn't really getting done anyway. So why not practice this thing that, that's seemingly countercultural, but that makes such a huge difference? Sometimes people think that, that this is for special Christians, monks, pastors. Nope. It's for you, and it's for me. Jesus practices this in a, in a huge way. So I just, very quickly, three, three benefits of solitude. If you do this, these things will happen, guaranteed. The first one is, the, is that you will gain ga greater strength from God. I mean, if you start trusting God, which to spend time with him, we got to do, right? Instead of doing it ourselves, we go and we spend time with him. I've never heard anyone ever tell me, look, I trusted God and he let me down. I actually used to hate this, this song that, that Bethany sang in, in the choir in college. It, it would go, he never failed me, he never failed me yet. The little yet on the end, that always bugged me because it's sort of, pre I mean, he hasn't failed me yet, but it's like I'm just waiting for that moment. I always hated that. But so there's this idea, if you trust God, if you lean into him, you will gain greater strength from God because God will show up. The second one is this, you will gain a greater trust in God because when God does show up, even if you just trust him with a little thing, you'll trust him more and you'll trust him more. So our trust in God begins to grow when we practice solitude and look to him in our lives. And the third one is this. You will develop a deeper relationship with God. See, isn't this just like everything else? We say we want that. We say we want intimacy with our Heavenly Father. We say we want our relationship to grow. We want to know him more. 
But then what do we do about that? We just get so busy with life that we don't practice the things that get us there. And I'm convinced that if we just take the time to carve out the space, some incredible things will start to happen. So let me end with just two stories that, that have taken place in a very fresh way this last month, and they've really been shaping my life. Uh, the first one is, for those of you, you who don't know, uh, the last Sunday I taught here at the, at the uh, end of July, that evening I went out for a mountain bike ride with a few people from New Hope. And, you know, uh, one of the individuals was uh, pretty new to mountain biking, and a couple of the rest of us were a little bit out of shape. And so we were stopping a lot more than I anticipated on our 10-mile ride. You know, so we were, we, we were stopping every mile marker, just making sure everyone was together, everyone was okay. And, uh, and so it got a little bit later than I anticipated. And so underneath the tree cover at dusk, it's darker. And so you don't see all the little bumps and nuances of the trail. And, and, and so we were getting really close to the end, maybe a mile and a half left, and I was flying down this hill. And, and, and I, I wasn't saying this out loud because that wouldn't be proper, but sort of in my heart and mind, the sentiment would be, wee! Huh? You know, because it was just fast hill, smooth trail, everything great. Now, when the trail's bumpy, one of the things that you, you know is you've got to keep your pedals flat because if there's anything you could hit a pedal on, that's bad, right? But the trail looked smooth, or so I thought, so I had this pedal low. And so I go from doing, I don't know, 20 plus miles an hour to all of a sudden, I'm flying through the air. And, and I didn't know, but there was a little hunk of dirt on the side that my pedal hit. So I go from 20 to like stop instantly. And, 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 and it was just perfect because, you know, if you're still going downhill, you could kind of hit and slide a little bit. But we had just kind of gotten, so it was like, it was just starting to go up. So it was like hit and hit. Um, and so I'm flying through the air. I landed on my head here and my shoulder. Um, and I just praise God that that next Sunday I could even teach. Like, because when I hit my shoulder, um, the, the person who was right behind me stopped and said, are you okay? And the first thing I said was, I broke my arm. Because it felt like it was just flopping there. Now, I don't know whether I broke my arm and God said, hey, you can't have a broken arm right now, so my arm's not broken, or um, it was just the trauma made it feel that way. However God wants to do that, I'm totally cool with it. Um, and, and so my bike continued on. It hit the seat, and it snapped the frame in two places. I'll show you a picture of the... There's a, your bike frame is not supposed to have that crack kind of thing there. It's just not supposed to look like that. Um, and then uh, my helmet, which is right here, uh, it still looks like it's a good helmet, but it actually has broken through in six or seven places where the foam is... Comp so and I just thank God that this is what broke and not this. Here's what, here's what this looked like, though. That was, that was immediately afterwards. That was just from impacting the helmet that impacted my head. So this happened, and the first thing after I got home and kind of cleaned up and I had ice on me, the next thing I did was I called Vicky to say, I don't think I'm coming in for staff day tomorrow. We're gonna have to, you're going to have to let the guys know that this just isn't going to work for me tomorrow. And, and I, I had a lot of ibuprofen and a lot of bed rest for a, a couple days. But that Monday, just after this had happened, and there was a lot of things I needed to get done and people I needed to meet with and things I wanted to talk about. Um, but it was one of those moments where I kind of woke up for a few minutes and I, I, I grabbed my laptop that was sitting there and I was looking at Facebook and, and there was an interview that someone had tagged that Fox News did with Billy Graham at 92 years old here recently. And they asked him two questions that he gave the same answer to. The first question was this. They said, you know, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? Here's a guy who's reached millions and millions of people for the kingdom of God, and they're asking him what he'd do differently. And then the other question that he gave the same answer to was, what advice would you give to young pastors? And he gave the same answer. He said, I would, I would do less I would travel less, I would speak less, 
and I would spend more time in meditation and prayer. Here's a man who for, for decades and decades and decades, God has used to reach millions. And his secret to success that he would do and pass on to us would be do less and make sure you're connected with God more. That's a significant thing. And that marked me in a week where I had to do less. The other story that marked me was friends of mine, and some of you have heard this because we ask for prayer in a number of different ways, but some friends of mine um, had their 12-year-old daughter walking the dog in the neighborhood, and this otherwise healthy girl had a brain aneurysm rupture. She fell over and was brain dead. And Bethany and I, a couple weeks ago on Friday, traveled up to Michigan to perform a funeral for a 12-year-old girl. And it was just brutal. And this girl loved Jesus, so there's hope. But as a parent, you should just never have to bury your child. And in the midst of that, it was just a day after they determined that she was brain dead, my friend Mike called me, and he was in tears. And, and, and he said this. He didn't say, hey, keep praying for Cindy and I. He didn't say pray for our friends or family. What he said was, we've decided to give the gift of life. We're donating all of our organs Pray for the recipients of those organs. Pray for those people who without this tragedy wouldn't have life that can now have life. And I just want to be honest, in that moment, it, that didn't make any sense to me because if I experienced that kind of loss, that would be the last thing that would come to my mind, just being totally honest about it. I'd be thinking about me and I'd be thinking about my loss. But here were people who in the most difficult time in life are thinking about others and asking for prayer for others. What fuels that kind of living? It's carving out space to be with God. It's practicing solitude. When we don't do this, I fail myself. I fail you because I don't have anything valuable to give to you. We fail each other. And most importantly, we miss out. We miss out on the kind of life that can only be lived if we are intimately connected in a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. So, plane, the plane is, it, it's been circling. We're coming in, all right? We're going to land right here. Uh, does anybody else want your life to count in bigger ways? Does anyone else want to be a part of something bigger? I mean, it's cool to think about what God has done, but there's the question mark, right? What is He going to do next? How are we going to let him work in and through us? Does anybody else want to be a part of the movement of God here in this region? Really? This is it? <laughs> we do, don't we? Thanks, Jackie. That's a good one. You can do it that time. Um, we want to be a part of this, right? We want God to work and move. And so in order to do this, we have got to carve space out in our lives to be with God. We've just got to do this. And so just, just a couple questions or, or, or opportunities. For some of you today, God is saying, will you this week carve out some space just to be alone with me? I don't care if it's 30 minutes. That's a great place to start. For some of you, you need to say to God, yes, this week on Tuesday at 6.30 in the evening, whatever it is for you, God, yes, here's what I'm going to do. And you need to tell somebody else, come tell me, and you need to follow through and do it. And for some of you, here's the other thing. You may be good at this, but can you help someone else do it? Is there someone else, you know, that's just overrun that you can say, hey, can I look after the kids one evening? Can I help with this so that you can just get alone, breathe deep, and experience God? Some of you today, God, I think, is saying, you know that person. God will identify that person for you that you need to go and do a little bit of help for them so that they can connect with and experience God. Anyone else feel like your life just looks and feels like this sometimes? Did you, did you feel that as the words were being painted up there? Greed, anger, pride, lust, whatever. And all of those things just bleed together and create a bloody mess. And that's, you know... Anyone else? And, and it's, it's a struggle, right? Because it's like, oh, 
I, I battle all these things. And, and even if this isn't your life, and you feel like your life is pretty good, the only answer for you is still Jesus. And so God, today, I pray that you would help us because we live in a world that models activity and busyness and pace and all kinds of things that, that we have, have lived and, and they haven't amounted to much at all. But God, today, we're telling you that we want our lives to count. And, and God, we, we want to live in a way that causes your kingdom to come crashing into earth in ways that transform people's lives in our community. And so God, today, I just, I pray that you would help us to just take the simple step of solitude to say, okay, this week on this day at this time, I'm going to, I'm going to create some space for you, God, and I'm going to get along with you and whatever that looks like, fine, but I'm going to begin practicing what Jesus lived over and over and over again. And Lord, for those of us who just feel like our life has been a mess, God, I pray that you would impress upon us again that the Jesus who died for us is real and he is here and he wants to meet us where we are if we will only reach out and let him do that. So as we close with this song, I don't want you to stand up as, as we start it, but if you're going to say today, God, I'm going to, on this day at this time, create some space to practice solitude so I can work on my relationship with you. If God's asking that of you and you say, yeah, I'm going to do it, I'd invite you to stand as we sing this song. And if there's somebody you know that God speaks to you about that you want to help them out in some way so that they can create some, some room to connect with God, I want you to stand during this song. And if your life has just been really, really difficult and you realize that Jesus is the only answer and you want to say, yep, I'm reaching out for Jesus, I would invite you to stand during this song as well. And let's let God do what only he can in and through our lives.
this week, plan to spend some solitude with the Lord, get to know him a little bit better in a new way, and then come and join us today at 2.30 at Round Lake for our family reunion and baptism celebration. It should be awesome. Have a good week.